my distinct pleasure to introduce Ron Morris, who also has been a coach at LA State, which is now known as Cal State Los Angeles. But also he is the owner for many years of On Track, which is a, an equipment, track and field equipment company. So Ron, if you'd come up here, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Doug. Um, you know, that's uh, Doug Smith from, we used to say, Accidental, <laughs> Ac Accidental College. I'm telling you, when, when, when I was at USC, those guys were great. I mean, you know, Oxy has kind of, kind of dropped off in terms of being first class as far as track and field is concerned. But we'd go to the relay with those guys. And we had a pretty good team at SC during those years. But, uh, so, but we called it uh, accidental. Anyway, uh, Doug uh, had uh, quite a bit of uh, 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 competition and so forth. And uh, uh, the uh, Coliseum relays, and I remember seeing pictures of Doug and Coliseum relays at the finish. Hundred, what was the only? He was the only white sprinter in the race, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, um, uh, the Striders was uh, was pretty important to me. Uh, when I was in high school, as Doug pointed out, uh, I set the national high school record at the time, and uh, uh, went on and competed in the, in the Southern Pacific AAU championships with all the college and open uh, guys and I won the, the, the district AAU meet. So, uh, wow, we, you know, this guy he deserves to go back to the AAU championships. Of course, that time there was no striders. That was 1953. 1953, um, again, as I say, I was still in, just coming out of high school and uh, uh, LA Athletic Club was putting together a, a team and uh, so I competed for the LA Athletic Club. I think I got seventh in the national championships and so forth. But it was after that, and I think the Striders, is from what I can understand, it was 55 that the Striders put uh, this organization together. Uh, of course, the pro one of the problems was is that the, the black athletes had uh, didn't really have the advantages. Uh, the LA Athletic Club was was a problem uh, for the black athletes, and so um, this group of athletes got together and thank you for uh, a group of doctors who really helped out and so forth. And that uh, I think it was that was the first year that I competed <clears throat> in the uh, in the national championships after call after the. Uh, the NC2A championships. And the Striders would pick up all of the, the local athletes out of UCLA and Oxy and, and USC and so forth, and we had a really a great team. Um, I remember uh, some of the people they talked about, uh, Mel Whitfield, and in fact, uh, Mel Whitfield had, had, uh, had gone to, I think, Ohio State, and for some reason, he had, uh, they figured out how he had a, a year of eligibility, and uh, so he ran at, uh, at uh, LA State, which is where I ended up coaching eventually uh, for one year, and he held, a, here was the Olympic champion that, that held the, the, the 880 record at the school. So anyway, uh, I continued to be a part of the Strider organization as we continued to uh, compete during college and after college. I graduated in uh, college in 57, stayed and got my uh, teaching credential and my master's degree. Vietnam, it was just before Vietnam, uh, things were beginning to heat up and um, so I wanted to try to complete my, my uh, graduate year at SC and so I shot across the street to the armory and talked to the 
individual over there at the National Guard and so forth, but uh, when I uh, uh, was supposed to come back the next week, why, they closed enlistments because they were trying to get people drafted. I went back and the, and the board officer said, oh, don't worry, we'll post date your entry. So they, they signed me up and so forth. And uh, so that particular year, uh, that was 58, and that was the first year that we had the U.S. versus the Soviet Union. Uh, they set up that track meet with uh, two uh, athletes in each event, both male and female. And um, so uh, in the national championships that year at Bakersfield, uh, they chose a team. And I happened to win the nationals that year, and Jimmy Brewer, another uh, young pole vaulter at USC then, as a, I believe he was a, uh, probably a freshman or sophomore at the time, we were the two pole vaulters on the team. <clears throat> and uh, so I was supposed to go in basic training that summer, as soon as I graduated from my, uh, my master's degree. And uh, so, boy, I got, I got a pickle, but I, now I've made the team. And so I went back over and talked to the warrant officer. He says, well, we'll have to talk to the major. I hadn't been that basic training yet. And uh, so the major came out. We talked a little bit. And he says, well, yeah, you're representing the U.S. You're going over to the Soviet Union to compete against the, the, the Ruskies. So uh, we'll put you on leave. So they put, they put me on leave. And I went off on this trip. And um, we, went to, we went to Moscow. Uh, first, we, we flew into Helsinki, and they said, well, uh, the Russians are going to send in a jet to pick you guys up. And that was 1958, and we weren't, we weren't flying jets in, not commercially anyway. And so we were all waiting for that Russian jet. It didn't show up until we flew in into thin air in planes. We were in Moscow uh, for about, oh, maybe five, six days before. Uh, we 
finished there and we ended and we went to uh, Budapest, Hungary. Uh, in the pole vault there at, in, in Moscow, I, I swear there were two by twos in that sawdust. Uh, it was pretty rough stuff. But uh, when we got to, uh, to uh, Budapest, it was uh, sand level with the ground. And, uh, and you, you know, it was really funny because I wasn't too sure if, if that was a polo pit there. <laughs> because I thought it was a long jump pit because they had it screeded off, you know, nice and flat, level and everything. Anyway, we jumped there. Uh, uh, we had a full crowd of people uh, in the stadium and we ended, we uh, then went on to Warsaw, Poland. Same thing, another uh, sand landing pit. Well, we were we weren't too, too used to sand here, but unless we got down into Texas and so forth, where the wind was blowing and it blew away all the sawdust, and there was only sand left. But anyway, the the last uh, thing on the on the trip was Athens, and here we are in Athens with our and so they they say we're we're going to compete in the in the original. Modern Olympic Stadium, 1896. If you've ever seen a picture of that stadium, it's it's marble stands and there's no seats. It just it's it platforms up and people just uh, they either stand there or they sit down on the edge of it. Uh, the the straightaways are about 20 yards apart and it's not banked, so you can imagine like the, the quarter milers or the the intermediate hurdlers trying to hold their lane. That was not a, that was a ground rule that you could leave your lane because they just couldn't hold their lane because it was so, such a sharp turn. And the discus throwers, uh, they took the, the javelin, they, they put it out of the stadium because they couldn't keep the javelin out of the stands. Uh, and that, and for some of you older athletes, you may remember the the, the big uh, javelin, that big held uh, javelin, a hollow wooden javelin, and the damn thing would get up there, and if you got a crosswind, it would just take off sideways. <laughs> anyway, in the discus, of course, they had a wider sector at that time. They tightened up the sector a little bit in the discus. But the sector went into the stands. <laughs> and I remember Ring Babka saying, if you're not ready to throw and you've been warming up and you still need a, uh, another throw or two, he said, just keep it inbound, but throw it into the stands. <laughs> and you know, if it stayed inbound, but landed in the stands, they give him another throw. So it didn't count. <laughs> well, the pole vault was, uh, we, we'd been watching and all of the new stands had a guy, a Greek pole vaulter by the name of George Robanis. And George had placed in the Olympics uh, in uh, 56. Uh, he was the only Greek pole vaulter, I think, that had ever gotten a medal. And George had come to the U.S. and, and had gone to, to a accidental over there. And of course, he didn't last. <clears throat> he didn't last very long at Occidental because uh, he tried to talk the females over there into this. What, what was it? Some kind of love? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and it was free love. Free, that's what they called it. Man. Free love. And uh, I think uh, that was a, that's a religious school over there. So where, where did he end up? UCLA. Anyway, George's picture was on all of the magazines and as we got to, into Athens. And uh, so that was a big deal. You know, we had to go head to head with with George, and of course they had, uh, they had about oh maybe six eight inches of sawdust in that pit, and we're we're in that stadium, that little narrow stadium. The bar goes up, we move along, we move along, and so so forth. Now we're down to just a couple of us. George is still jumping. Anyway, uh, just before we got to the kind of the maximum height where you could say, okay, I'm either going to win or this guy's going to beat me. All of a sudden, the official steps out on the runway and waves a red flag. No more jumping, no more jumping. Now, what are they talking about here? We're really ready to go. Uh, no, and so it was, 
we come to find out that uh, they were going to run the steeplechase. And the problem was that the distance between the two straightaways was so tight and so close that they had to cut across the pole runway to take the water jump. <laughs> and the, the Greek sheeple chaser was really good because he knew how just how to do that. Because once he came off the water jump, he only had like two steps and he had to make a left-hand turn and go back down the straightaway. So anyway, that was kind of our, our time there. Uh, uh, in, on that trip. As soon as I got back, the next day I'm on the bus for Fort Ord. And uh, I spent my time at Fort Ord and eventually uh, got out after six months of active duty and tried to get back for the 59 season and get going and I had to get a job and make some money. I went down to the, uh, 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 what had happened was the uh, uh, the semester had already started. I, did, I was two, a couple weeks late getting out, and uh, so I went down to LA Unified, snooped around down there, talked to them in there. No, no, they didn't have anything in physical education at the time, and uh, so uh, I was kind of discouraged. And I'm getting ready to go home, and some guy come up to me and tap me on the shoulder, and I, I turned around and I recognized the face. He said, Ron, what are you doing down here? And it was a guy, it was an AAU official. And uh, he, I, I said, well, I'm down here looking for, trying to see if I can get a job. And he said, uh, well, you haven't been too successful? He says, well, what's your major? I said, my major is physical education. Uh, he says, well, what about your minor? I said, my minor is biological science. I had to take anatomy and physiology and all that other stuff, so I might just well get a minor in it. He says, well, I'm in charge of the... Uh, uh, of the science in the LA Unified District. He says, uh, would you be interested in teaching? I says, I'll do anything. I got, I got to make some money. I says, uh, 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 I was married at the time and, and uh, things were a little straight, uh, hard to, to get things put together and so forth. So he said, well, come on into my office. He said, well, we'll let's take a look at this. He said, okay, this semester started uh, two weeks ago, he says, but I, I got a couple of openings here. He says, I got one at San Pedro, and I lived in Burbank at the time, and I, he says, I got one in San Pedro. He says, then I got one over here at Van Nuys High School. Oh, geez, that's in the valley. That's pretty good. He said, uh, oh, that's a good deal. He says, because you know the principal over there at Van Nuys High School, he's an AAU official also. I said, well, that's good. That gives me something to talk about. So I went over and uh, had a meeting. He called over there and made an appointment for me. And went over and talked to, to, to Bill Noble, who was the principal. And, and so then I headed for home after my interview. And I was home about a half an hour. He gets in, I have phone rings, and he says, I'd like to have you for the job if you'd like to have it. And I said, well, what's the job? It was five classes of life science. Okay, I was not my minor, uh, that was my minor, but not my major. I did my student teaching and physical education, both junior high and high school level. Ooh, wow, I got five classes of life science. They've been there now for two weeks. They've had five substitutes. Five substitutes. Here's this first time teacher going in with a minor in biological science. I got in my car and I think I broke, uh, I don't know how many speed limits and zoomed back and the library hadn't closed and I, I got the textbook and then I went home and I stayed up all night and tried to put something together. And what I found out was that the reason why there was an opening there was that the, the original teacher had given uh, kind of a, one of these uh, sex questionnaires uh, to the students and one little girl, this was these were the 10th graders, one little girl went home and told her mother and they had him out of the classroom and that's why they had the opening. So Morris walks in the first day, you know, and I had my tie on and boy, I was looking pretty sharp. And uh, so I write, go to the board and I write, 
Mr. Morris, and I write on the board up here, and oh, and so the students come in, and the, and there's this one young girl in the front row, and she's got to kind of hikes up her skirt a little bit, you know, and showing a lot of leg, and she raises her hand, and she said, when are you going to teach us what Mr. Cook taught us? <laughs> Well, the only thing that I remembered that I really got out of education classes that I had to take that nobody wanted to take in college was that one guy had said, you can always get easier, but you can't get tougher. And I was the meanest SOB that ever lived. Man, those kids hated me. And I was just on top of them big time, and it was the only thing that saved me. But anyway. Um, a couple of other things, little short things about with regards to the Striders. Um, you know, we, we were a loose-knit group. Uh, we, we weren't a club uh, in terms of going to train together or anything. We were all just individual athletes that were training in other different places. And even once when I finished college and got out of college, started to teach and so forth, I would train at the, at the college. I started teaching there at Van Nuys High School. I put in the rest of that semester. They then built Grant High School, a brand new school right next to uh, LA Valley College. The principal came up from that college to interview teachers and uh, he wasn't supposed to interview me because I was a long-term sub, but he did anyway and he said, I want you to come down there. And so I went to Grant for a year and then after that year, uh, the uh, Northridge, which was San Fernando Valley College, opened, and the head coach at LA State transferred to uh, to that school out in the valley, and that opened up the job at uh, uh, the LA. The assistant coach was promoted to head coach, but the, op the assistant coaching job was open, and uh, and I remember he was talking about Mike Larrabee. Uh, Mike got all over me and said, you know, you got to get over there, you know, apply for that job. So I did and I got the job. But the only problem was I was still competing. And the rule says at that time you couldn't get paid for, uh, for preparing a team for competition. That's the way it was written. Otherwise you're pro. And, you know, I'm not ready to quit. You know, I had... Uh, I'd been to the to the uh, to the Olympics, and I just came back off of that 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 team, and so I'm still I got still got to compete. So I I taught and a full load of classes and uh, did my coaching for nothing. I was investigated every year for six years. The pre the president would get a letter from somebody who I think might have been maybe another coach that we were competing against. Morris can't be coaching, he's a pro. Uh, he's, and then the president would have to go to the athletic director. The athletic director would then uh, talk to the president. They were, the president would have a letter written back. No, he's not getting any compensation for his coaching and so forth. So, But anyway, as we progressed, I kept competing for the Striders. And I remember, uh, well, we were a first-class outfit, the Strider Bunch, you know. Um, uh, Chuck Coker, was a, who had been the coach at Occidental, was, a, was our coach, and Chuck was an amazing guy. He had this old tiny car he drove around, I think it was an MG or something, and a little con, uh, open uh, roadster. And uh, he would come over once a week to, to L.A., where I was teaching and co coaching, and then he would help me a little bit with my actual volley. And and I remember we used to, we'd have meets down in uh, Arizona and uh, New Mexico and so forth. And so we flew out of Burbank. Uh, uh, we, we had, a, there was a charter outfit there uh, called Blatt's Airline, you know, and they were big time, you know, Blatt's. They had, I think, three DC-3s. And if you know what a DC-3 is, well, no, most of you are not old enough to know what a DC-3 is, but those were those, those planes that they flew over the hump uh, out of Burma during the Second World War in order to try to get supplies in there to the Chinese who were fighting the Japanese. So anyway, they had three of these things, 
and if you know how they, they sat on the runway uh, down on the tail wheel and so when you climbed into the back of the plane you had to go up you know the aisle and it was really steep because it was sitting so low on the tail wheel and, uh, and I remember one time uh, Dave Davis who was uh, one of the SC shot putters and uh, Dave was an interesting guy in fact, uh, uh, we, there's all kinds of stories about Dave. But anyway, Dave was trying to come on the aisle, and he's trying to get up the aisle, up the steep incline, and he's got a hold of one of the seats, and he's pulling on the seat, and he broke it off right at the bottom. <laughs> so that the stewardess came back and says, well, that's the end of that seat. We won't be able to use it. But anyway, and then another time, uh, we, we were flying down, I think it was to Albuquerque, and uh, this old DC-3 is putting along. They got a pilot and a co-pilot and a stewardess. And uh, it's hot, the desert is really hot, and we're flying low, and, and the ca captain uh, says, uh, we're gonna have to take her up. He says, I gotta get it up higher. He says, or you guys are all gonna be sick. And so, you know, and you could see these guys reaching for the bags so forth anyway so he takes it up and sitting across from me is Jerome Walters. Does anybody know Jerome? Jerome was a Jerome was a, a, a half miler and so we got up and Jerome passed out because of I guess they got it too high then the oxygen I don't know what the problem was but so Jerome passed out so they, they the stewardess ran to get the oxygen and she came back and the oxygen thing was broken. So they had to get a second one. Finally, they got him revived, and we got back down there. And I think that by the time we got everybody off the plane, why they were all over on the wall, you know, kind of uh, irrigating things over there. But anyway, that, that's kind of the way. And one time we were, one time we came, we were coming back. I don't think it was that trip. It was another one. We're coming back, you know, and and the pilot says, uh, well, we're running a little bit low on fuel. I don't know whether we're going to make it back to Burbank. And uh, so they put it down out in the desert somewhere. I don't know where the hell it was. It was, it was just like it was a strip, and there was a little little Quonset hut there and so forth. And we sat out there for about two and a half hours while they waited for the, the, the gas to come in from the closest town to fill it back up again to get us back in. But those were some of the things that... We did. I was. Uh, I competed for the Strider 13 years, uh, uh, from the time I first competed with them when I was in college until I. Uh, my last year was 1966, and uh, anyway, that was. Give you. I don't want to really get everybody all out and tired here, but I thought what was kind of interesting about my career as a pole vaulter was that. I span a, a very interesting uh, part of the history of this event. Uh, most of the events, of course, changed in that the track finally changed in terms of dirt to all weather surfaces. But of course, the shoes got better. You saw those old shoes over there that uh, that better get brought in. Uh, in fact, I, I had a, a pair of shoes that I forgot to bring that I, <clears throat> I traded at one of the one of the Soviet vaulters in 1960 and uh, it, it, the spikes were about two inches long and so forth. They weren't wearing them, they were wearing the Titus by then, but they were trading and I traded an old golf shirt for two pair of these shoes you know, and then I have them in my room over my shop so that the kids can see it. But anyway, um, I got started in uh, we, we lived in Glendale, California, and up till the fifth grade, and then right after the war, in uh, about 1945, uh, late in 45, we moved to Burbank, and uh, my dad worked for the newspaper, he was in the mechanical end of the newspaper, and uh, uh, I remember uh, we had, uh, we had bl those black uh, uh, blinds on our house so if they had a, 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 a dark out you had to pull the blinds down you couldn't show any lights and uh, and he had we had uh, special things on the headlights of our car he had an old 37 Pontiac 
and uh, it had these strips so that there was just a little fine line for light. And uh, he was, uh, if the newspaper was always important, and, and if he, he had to get in a lot of times because the, the guy, the janitor, might in the middle of the night say, the power's off and the, and the, the pot, which they made the, the plates that went on the press, you know, it's cold and he'd have to get in and kick, crank that up so that they'd have molten lead to pour the thing. So anyway, we moved to, to, to Burbank and I had to kind of fight my way in as a sixth grader there, new kid, you know, they called me Glendale, you know, uh, there's that crazy kid from over there, that other town and so forth. And But I had, by that time, I hadn't hadn't really gotten into, into pole vaulting, but um, we did uh, uh, have a big vacant lot out behind where we lived, and uh, uh, we, you know, of course, made tracks and drove our bikes on it and so forth. But then we had a couple of uh, kids in the neighborhood who were were in the, just into high school, so we kind of watched them, and so we, then we made our own pit out in the vacant lot. And people say, "What did you use the land in?" I says, "Well, we had a shovel. You just turned over the dirt." And then that was your landing, and then you dug a hole, and that was the box where you planted your pole, and you used uh, two by fours, and you uh, pounded nails in them at different heights, and then that was your. And we, I, I remember uh, the record for uh, for the neighborhood. I think was uh, uh, six ten, and that was the, the record, and that was we we'll always strive to see if we could get the record. What. Um, uh, I also started to, then got involved in, in uh, Little League Baseball and the problem with that was is that, you know, I, I, was, I was a halfway decent athlete. I wasn't great, but I mean, I wanted to be really good, so I spent a lot of time at it. And, you know, here I am sitting on the bench, but the guy, the coach was, the, his son played the same position I did. And so I'm on the bench and his son, I think it was second base. And why am I sitting here on the bench? I'm better than that kid. I know I am. And, but, so then I got mad and so I just left the team and uh, decided that I wanted to get into a sport that I could, you know, that I didn't have to, the coach didn't have to put me in or, uh, uh, or they wouldn't throw the ball to me or whatever. And so the pole vault was what I got looking at. And uh, we had, in junior high school, when we went to junior high school, uh, we had, uh, when I first went, we had two junior highs in the city, and we had meets within our school, and then we'd have an all-city meet. And uh, then after the first year, why, they built two new junior highs, and then we had, and they made the one junior high the, uh, into the high school. And so we then had two, two high schools, but uh, we still had our competitions and then our all-city competitions. And if you, um, if you set a city record, then uh, the thing was you got this little silver track sheet, you know, the little thing that you could put on a, on a chain or whatever, and that was the big deal. Always have something to shoot for. So anyway, I set the city record uh, in the ninth grade at 11-4, I think, and so I was able to get this little track shoe from the mayor and the, they took the picture and it was in the local paper and so forth. And we had, then we had what we called the, the Valley News and Green Sheet. And that was now, it's the Daily News now. And the Valley News and Green Sheet, the Green Sheet was the sports. And so, boy, we get that paper and boy, everything would just get thrown away except the Green Sheet. You'd want to find it. And they had good writers and so forth. And then we had, a, B, in high school we had A, B, and C uh, sports, so uh, you got uh, exponents, they said, so you, they took your age, your height, and your weight, and if you were, say, a young guy and pretty small, you'd always be a C, and then if you were really a tiny guy, you might even be a C as a senior, but uh, anyway, so we, we didn't have a very good football team. And, but the B, B football team was pretty good, so all the guys tried to lose weight during the summer, you know, and then they'd get there and they'd scrouch down, you know, so they wouldn't be very tall and say, okay, you're a B. And then, so they'd play B football, 
and, and then they wouldn't give, they wouldn't uh, test them again all year. And some of those kids, you know, were pretty good sized kids, you know, so they were, this the guy was a, a B and he was now in B track and field and he weighs, you know, 175 pounds and he's a senior, you know. So anyway, that's uh, kind of where, where it went and uh, then eventually I got off, uh, I did uh, my senior year, I said that I won the state meet two years, my junior year and my senior year, and set the national high school record at that time. And again, it's kind of interesting because I started on, a, when I went to, uh, in junior high school, we used whatever we could get a hold of. The first pole was a, uh, was an aluminum, a little small aluminum pole, like conduit almost. Uh, and uh, uh, we used that and then uh, my uh, senior year, uh, boy, I was getting into the house and my, my dad was really good at helping all the time and so forth. So he said, okay, Ron, we're going to take you up to the Sea and Jungle Shop. We had a place up on San Fernando called the Sea and Jungle Shop. And they had things like tiki torches and netting and stuff that people would put around their pool for decoration. And then they had a lot of bamboo poles. So we went up there and we found somehow that's just about right. I think that's going to work fine. And so um, then I taped the thing up. Every section I taped it up. I think it weighed twice as much with the extra tape on it. But anyway, um, when I got to high school, uh, the, the coach was a was an old Trojan long jump sprinter, and he didn't know too much about the pole vault, but uh, so here, yeah, here Morris is coming, and we're gonna have to get him a new pole. So uh, he said, all right, Ron, I'm gonna take you down to Los Angeles. We went down to some sporting goods place and back in the back room, it was a little dark back there and so forth. And then so we picked out a pole, and I and I looked at that pole, and I, up at the top was a decal that had Dutch Warmer Dam signature on it. Boy, and I'll tell you, Warmer Dam was the god for all pole vaulters because Dutch Warmer Dam out of Fresno, California, was the first 15 foot vaulter in 1940. Set the world's record. Nobody had ever jumped over 15 feet, and he jumped 15, 7, 3 quarters as the outdoor record, 15, 8 and a half as the indoor record. Stood for, God, you know, the next 15 footer was was Bob Richards and he never broke the record and uh, so forth. But anyway, here was his pole with his, boy, I'll tell you who, man, I, I think I slept for that pole. <laughs> Took it out the first day and boy, that baby is working, you know. And I jumped, I, well, I jumped about 11 and a half feet, ninth grade, and first workout, and geez, I made 12 feet. And I uh, put it up to 12 four and I broke it. And uh, so that was the end of that poll. And uh, so then uh, uh, my coach says, well, you know, I heard about this fiberglass poll. Now this, you have to remember, this is 1951. And uh, so he got me a, a fiberglass pole. The things were brittle, stiff, they didn't bend, and they weighed about the same amount. The, the bamboo poles were better because you could get a little spring out of a bamboo pole. But what the problem was, and when we went to steel poles, was after the war, all, before the war, Second World War, all the, loom, all the bamboo was coming out of the east. And as soon as the war started, that was the end of bamboo poles. So all of the, the American boulders were all using whatever was here at the time. And then they just, and then right after the war, they tried to bring them in quick. And they didn't, they didn't cure them right. And so then they were looking for something else. And then they went to the, went to the steel and the alloys, the aluminum alloys and things like that. So anyway, I used the, that non-bending fiberglass pole all the way through high school. And uh, when I went to college, why uh, coach over there, Mortensen, he says, ah, he says, those damn, those damn poles are no good. He says, we're gonna get you a, a Gill Vault Master steel pole. And so I think he paid 24 bucks for it. And, uh, uh, so I used that same pole for four years in college, and when, when I was out of college, Mort says, Ron, you can have that pole. He says, yeah, thanks, coach. And so I got five more years out of it. So I got nine years out of that old steel pole before I got caught in the change. And in the Olympic Games in 60, 
We went to the to the trials, Stanford, and uh, Stanford was that was my place. I, I it's amazing whenever you do well somewhere, what what that means uh, later on. And uh, I had jumped as a sophomore at Stanford, and they that was the big football stadium, which they have since torn down and rebuilt, and they have a regular track stadium now. But if they had a grass runway, it was like the green on the golf course, and they only had about two or three meets all year in that stadium. And we went up for the for the Stanford the SC dual meet when I was a sophomore, and my bowling buddy who was a senior and I both made 14, uh, nine and three quarters, and uh, they wrote in the paper up there that uh, the heavenly twins are reborn at USC. And the reason why they said that was that SC world, uh, their record was 14-11 uh, uh, by Sefton and Meadows back in the 30s, and they both jumped the world record on the same day in the Coliseum. And they were both SC guys. Anyway, uh, that was my sophomore year. I went back uh, in my senior year on the, in the dual meet in the same nice grass runway and jumped uh, 15, two and a half, set the SC record. And uh, sure enough, that's where the 60 trials were, same place. So I walked into the, to the 60 trials with a pretty good confidence that I can do well at this place. And I did, I made, made the team there, jumped 15 to five. Uh, uh, the bar went to the world's record. I was first vaulter. Uh, had a really a good jump, you know. I, uh, I, I think if I'd had my standards placed a little bit differently, I might have made it. And then my uh, my partner, who's not my partner, but Don Bragg, the guy who won and won the Olympics, made uh, the world's record again on his first jump. I still had two jumps to go, but that was uh, about 45 minutes later after they got all the hoopla and the measuring and everything done. But uh, Anyway, that uh, uh, basically uh, is what happened, and then I finally got got caught in the in the, the fiber, the real fiberglass change. And I went back in '61 uh, to uh, the national championships um, in in '61, and uh, uh, I think I'm not sure. I think was that the, was that the one where we flew the Connies? Yes. Okay, we were flying con the old Constellation with the Tri tail prop then, and and I remember I had a picture that I put in my catalog, my uh, and uh, we were we couldn't get the pole vaulting pole in the luggage it was too too short, and we tried to get it in the cabin and we couldn't get it in the door because of the the bar was in the way there where they served the food and we couldn't turn the corner so we had to put it through the pilot's window. <laughs> And he opened his little window and we stuffed the pole down through the pilot's window, then down through the door and left it in the, in the aisle. But uh, anyway, that was 61, uh, went back there. I remember, uh, it seems to me like it was, we had a place that was no air conditioning. Uh, Mel's on, I remember I had to sleep with Mel's on. Big Mel, he weighed about 300 pounds, I think. He was one of the official guys and, and he snored all night. But anyway, uh, I uh, I uh, uh, I jumped 58 on my old steel, which was about as high as anybody ever jumped on steel. And then come 62, and that winter, John Yosef makes 16 feet on fiberglass. And then oh, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And there's articles written, is this going to be illegal? Uh, they got to allow it. And all of the good steel ballers were afraid to change. And so I hung on and got to Mount Sac Relays. And uh, they torqued jump 16, two and a half, set the outdoor record. And they passed the record and then that was it. You either change or quit. And uh, so I, uh, they were making a poll down at Costa Mesa. I called the guy up. And, said, I got a change, can you make me a pole? I, I drove down uh, and picked up a pole and uh, came back and after my team had already gone 
and I, I took a couple of short runs on it and said, okay, now I gotta, gotta see if I can do with a, with a long run. And uh, I went back on a long run and I got it in a good bend and then I pulled on it like I did my old seal and I broke it off right under my bottom hand. And uh, then I had to go back and call uh, uh, Herb and tell him that I broke his pole. So well, I didn't get enough fiber on that. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, uh, the the uh, national championships were back at uh, uh, at Mount Sac, and I made 16 at Mount Sac and won the nationals at, at Mount Sac, and ended up going to Europe. He was talking about going overseas, and I ended my career in 1966, and I had a uh, Finnish buddy over there that I'd been jumping with and he had retired and he said, Ron, I'll help you get meats. And so I took my family and we went back over there and that after a full outdoor season, I jumped 35 meats in Europe that summer and uh, went back to a, to a place three years before that I'd set my PR, my personal record and improved it in that, into sawdust and on a dirt runway. So anyway, that's about it. I'm sorry to appreciate it.